Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Paxton. I am a research fellow in the School of uh, Mathematics and Statistics at the University of St. Andrews. I just do this stuff as a hobby. Um, my background is in zoology and I've become more and more um, sort of statistical, but I, I have an interest in sea monsters and um, mer people. And, um, and so, um, as part of an exhibition, which was going to be this summer at HMS Unicorn about the history of the mermaids, um, I, I'm, I'm giving this talk. Um, when that exhibition is actually going to be, um, Finley perhaps can tell you something about that uh, a bit later on. So what I'm going to talk about today then, um, a little based on my own research, um, some of it's kind of general, uh, the general history of mermaids, which perhaps can't really find online. Um, and so I'm going to go into the sort of scientific history of mermaids insofar or the history of mermaids from a scientific perspective. And it's going to be a biased perspective. It's going to be biased because it's kind of European centric. Although I'll start the story in the Middle East, um, it then becomes centered on, on, on Europe. Well, I, I, and, and that's really a reflection of my ignorance. Um, mer people are actually found around the world. Uh, in the Americas, in East Asia, in South Asia, in Africa. Um, but I'm really going to be talking about it just from a, a European uh, perspective. And my interest is kind of on changes in um, the, the, the attitude of um, natural philosophers and, and, and later on scientists towards um, uh, mer people and, and, mer and mermaids. But unfortunately, we've only got half an hour, um, so we can't really go into uh, too much detail. So it's a bit of a, a whistle-stop uh, tour. And here we've got an example of the sort of diversity of mer people. You can see this is a, a mer monk, and I'll talk about some um, mer monks a bit later on. It actually says um, zo monk, because this is actually from a Dutch uh, uh, document. So, so here we have a very early, um, probably from between the 10th and the 6th century BC, um, and this is an image from an Assyrian cylinder seal of Dagon the fish god, um, who was a deity of the Assyrians. And his exact form is slightly unclear because here it looks as if it's basically a human with a, a big fish costume on, on top. Um, and that's one form of Dagon. Uh, another form of Dagon is more like a natural merman, which you can see in this image here, where you can see it's actually it's sort of half a fish and half a half a human being. And Dagon um, is mentioned in the Bible. Um, another name for him is Oannes. And for the Babylonians, at least, he was the being that actually gave them civilization. So I've got a quote here from um, uh, uh, the historian Barossus. And he says, this being was accustomed to pass the day among men, and he gave them insight into letters and sciences and arts of every kind taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of uh, geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect the fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which would, could soften manners and humanize their lives. So it's to mermen that we really get civilization. In other words, if you believe the, the, the Babylonians. Um, so mermen sort of come first, but it doesn't take very long before we get our first uh, genuine mermaid. And that's the Syrian goddess Atagatis. Now, this is a coin of the Seleucid king Demetrius III from the first city. And this image that you see here is actually of the Syrian goddess Atagatis or Dukerto, um, also known as the, the Syrian god goddess to the Romans. And this is actually. Yes, a ostensibly female figure with arms and the whole body, rather than being sort of top human and bottom fish, the whole body is actually is actually fish. And that's how she's actually described. Um, this goddess has the head of a woman and the rest of the body is, is that of a fish. And that was Diodorus of Sicily was, was talking about this. Um, having said this, this is that's not really the form that um, Mer people take for the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks, in many ways, um, lacked um, imagination with their monsters. 
Because if you think of your average um, Greek monster, it's normally uh, what I would refer to as, as a zoologist as a chimera. It's not a hybrid, they're chimeras. Basically, it's an animal, a bit of an animal, stuck onto a bit of a human being. Um, the classic one is, of course, the chimera itself. But you can think of all, all many of the Greek monsters are, okay, not hydra, but many of the Greek monsters are basically, they're just chimeras. It's a, the minotaur, it's a human body with a bull's head, etc., etc. And that's what we actually see when we come to talk about mermaids and mermen in a, generally speaking, in a, um, in a marine context. So here we see um, a merman or a triton to the Romans and with a mermaid, and you can see it's got the tail of a fish and the upper body uh, of, a, of a female. Um, and this sort of image seems to have been inherited in all subsequent uh, European interpretations of the mermaid. I, I, I simplify a bit in that when I say that a, a, um, a merman is just a simple chimera of fish and, and human. Uh, they could have horns or even um, lobster claws as horns. Um, so, uh, and the other thing about tritons, not so much mer Roman mermaids, but tritons is that the Romans believed they were real. And the reason they believed they were real is that periodically they got washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean. And this begs the interesting question, what was getting washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean? But we have several accounts of tritons being washed up and they're talked about by people like Pliny, the Roman natural historian of the first century, in a, in a matter of fact way. So these things exist and they knew that they existed because they got washed up on beaches. Well, Rome falls, and then we move into the European medieval period, and um, mermaids start to diversify. Uh, here we have um, the medieval mermaid uh, from Scotland, dates to the 8th, 9th century from a um, picture symbol stone. And uh, you can see that, um, you can't really see it too well, but basically this is a classic mermaid in the sense it's got a um, human top half, but the bottom half consists of two fishy tails. Uh, and this again um, shows the sort of diversity that you can actually see in, in European mermaids after the Roman period. Here's um, some mermaids from some medieval psalters, and you can see they've got the classic mermaid type image of a tail with a female top half. And in the left-hand image, you can see um, the mermaid is, wearing, is, is holding a comb and a mirror. Now, I, I know that some medieval historians say that this is a, uh, meant to be a um, representation of um, female vanity. I'm not entirely convinced of this because you also see uh, mirrors and combs as single symbols by themselves on Pictish symbol stones, which implies to me that it's more likely that the, um, the comb and the mirror was an intrinsic um, feature of um, femininity. So that's an interesting, um, uh, that's an interesting image that occurs in, um, in, 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 in medieval uh, manuscripts. So um, medieval mermaids then, uh, they, uh, you see them in vestries, you see them in um, prayer books, you see them in um, uh, 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 actual physical, phys physical accounts of them from chronologies. Let me just find you a relevant quote. Um, so here we have the um, annals of Annals of the Four Masters from Ireland, and we have an account from uh, 1118 AD. Another wonderful um, tale from Ireland, a mermaid was taken by the fishermen of the Weir of Liscarlin in Ossery, and another at Port Lerge. And then we've got in 887, a mermaid was cast ashore in the country of Alba, so in Scotland. 145 feet was her length, 18 feet was the length of her hair, seven feet was the length of the fingers of her uh, uh, of her hand and seven feet was the length of her nose. And she was whiter than a swan all over. Well, that's actually an occurrence of, of um, a giant mermaids. They're often very, very white. There might be a reason for that. So the other issue about medieval mermaids is they are incredibly 
diverse, incredibly diverse. The um, the Romans may have lacked imagination. They might have just made chimera monsters, but medieval mermaids, they are very, very diverse indeed. Here we have a black mermaid. And again, notice that she's carrying that female symbol of fe uh, femininity, a, uh, a uh, looking glass. Um, and here we have um, two different sorts of, of mermaids. So we've got the mermaid in the classical sense of a mermaid that's got a fish's tail and the upper half is female. Um, but then we've got, on the right-hand side, a mermaid with a human upper half, but the lower half of a bird. And this, of course, is not a true mermaid, but a siren. But that distinction between mermaid and siren is not one which many European cultures actually uh, distinguish. So, for example, um, in, um, in Portuguese and, and Spanish, um, the, the word for uh, mermaid is actually, uh, is actually siren. But, of course, um, in English, we distinguish between sirens as half women, half bird, as opposed to mermaids, which are half, half woman, half fish. Um, but uh, this, the fact that some of the accounts of mermaids seem to suggest that they had wings uh, just meant that this wasn't an issue for the, for, for, for the medi medieval monks, and they just would indiscriminately draw mermaids as, as, uh, as mermaids or draw mermaids as sirenians. But they weren't passive. Here you can see they are actually um, physically attacking the um, people on board the boat. Um, sometimes they could obviously do that just with their own powers. Uh, but sometimes they needed um, weaponry. And here we see a mermaid who is uh, physically assaulting, uh, presumably a fisherman. Um, for what reason, I, um, I do not know. So, um, yeah, the siren, the mermaid, these could be uh, indistinguishable to, um, uh, to, to, to the medieval writers. Um, and again, mermaids could be very, very strange. This is from the 15th century Hortus Sanitatus. And you can see that basically we've got mermaids which have got additional uh, eyes in their torsos and mouths in their torsos. And some versions of this image that I've seen, actually, they don't have faces at all. Basically, their mouths are solely in, in their torso. Um, if that if that isn't weird enough for you, uh, here we've got a um, transsexual demonic uh, mermaid. Um, again, um, we can see that actually you can see in the top left hand corner here it actually does live in the sea and um, uh, presumably uh, foretold um, uh, 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 bad things yet to come. Uh, another strange hybrid from the medieval period is. The, the, which you've already seen, which is, of course, the Mermonk or Sea Monk or Monicus Maris. Um, these are strange animals that occur several times in um, European hi medieval history. The earliest time, actually, is um, it, from Scottish history, where a school of Mermonks were seen during the reign of King Aid, who was a early king of Scotland. I think he was the son of Kenneth MacAlpine. And uh, he didn't reign for very long. And one of the reasons he didn't reign for very long was that uh, a school of mermonks was seen in the Firth of Forth. And everybody generally assumed that this was a bad sign of uh, the future. And lo and behold, uh, King Aid or King Aeth uh, then um, subsequently was um, dethroned. Mermonks, um, later on, mermonks appear in um, a medieval uh, zoology that was written by Albert the Great. And he then says that they, um, this is a slightly different sort of mermonk, it appears. It's a mermonk that lives in the English Channel, and it's a cannibal. Sorry, it's not cannibal. Um, well, it's, it's it, well, it eats human beings. Um, and so if you were that the misfortune to, um, you could be charmed to jump off your boat, and then you get eaten, but eaten by the mermonk. So these weren't, um, these weren't, the equivalent of nice peaceful monks you might get on land. This is a an actual sort of creature that you um, you would find um, un under the sea. As we move into the Renaissance, we see you still get weird uh, mermaids. So here we have um, 
a mermaid from Conrad Gesner's um, Great Animal Encyclopedia. And you can see now that we've got the fish tail, but we've also got additional limbs here, as well as the um, a slightly um, strange uh, head. Here we have um, Gesner's image of a uh, merman and mermaid, which was seen in Egypt. And again, we can see that they've got these additional limbs. Um, you, you can see here and and these um, sort of long long ears and once more we actually see a mermonk now I'm, I'm going to flip ahead this is an embroidery of a mermonk made by a very famous uh, person in Scottish history um, the image he took it from is this one that you can see here um, and then she embroidered it uh, while she was under house arrest in England uh, with uh, Bess of Hardwick um, and this embroidery is now to be seen at Oxburg Hall in Norfolk. And this is the fame, one of the famous Marian embroideries, uh, which were done by Mary Queen of Scots when she was in exile in England. And she painted a lot of sea monsters, actually. Um, but she seemed, uh, and one of them was the sea monk, which you can see here, which is a slightly later version of the sea monk that we've already encountered it. She spelt it, you can't really see this, but it's S E A M O N K E. Um, slightly different spelling. This sea monk was um, found off the coast of Denmark in 1546, and it was sent to the king of Denmark, uh, Christian III, and he was so impressed with it that he ordered, ordered drawings to be made, and those drawings were sent to the, um, uh, were eventually made their way to the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and uh, and were ultimately made their way into the great um, animal encyclopedia of Gesner. It was from Gesner's encyclopedia that um, Mary Queen of Scots was engaged in her it was engaged in her embroidery. Um, well worth uh, seeing these uh, uh, hangings if you get the chance at uh, Oxburg, Oxburg Hall. I can give a whole lecture on the, the sea monk. I've written a paper on the sea monk, but uh, it's only a small part of the total history of, of uh, marine mer people, so I'm going to move on. Um, a very closely related animal, perhaps, to the mer monk uh, is the sea bishop. And here we hear it. we see the sea bishop. The sea bishop was washed up off the coast of Poland in either 1421 or 1521. Um, as I found records of the sea bishop before 1521, I'm pretty sure it actually was in 1421. And it made it was taken alive to the king of Poland where it genuflected and indicated in some non-verbal way that it wished to be returned to the sea, and the Polish king uh, very kindly uh, decided that he would return the bishop uh, fish to, to the sea. Well, that bishop fish was alive, but it has been suggested that the way that something like the bishop fish was actually created was as a um, sort of uh, gaffed model taken from a dried ray. So you might get something that looked a bit like this. So what's happened here is that someone has taken a ray, uh, it's dyed, they've dried it, and in the process of drying it, they sort of sculptured it to make it look like a sort of uh, strange mer being. And these objects, which you can still find today, there are people who still make them, are called Jenny Hanavers. Where that name comes from is rather unclear, but they were curios that have been created over the last few centuries. And this, this, this one, this drawing of this one actually dates back to the 15th century. Another strange animal which occurs both in medieval times and in during the Renaissance, and this is from um, the Garden of he um, Heavenly Delights, uh, is the Myrnite or Zitteron. And so um, that was an armored knight with the tail of a fish. What I'm unclear about is whether there was anything underneath the armor of the of the sea knight, whether literally the top of them was a knight and the bottom of them was a fish. Um, where this comes from, I don't know. There are fishes that have got kind of hard, bony armor, so maybe that's the that's the idea of it. But a direct zoological origin of the um, sea bish of the sea knight is is slightly unclear. Whereas the sea monk and the sea bishop we can probably say that it's got a zoological zoological origin the sea knight is slightly less clear what that zoological origin actually is there also were sea giants 
and here we have uh, a seed giant. And um, people, our earliest first-hand account of a merman, where there's actually a witness who says, I saw this. Uh, actually, our second, our second, our second. Um, our second, our second first-hand account of, of, of a, a merman is actually of a mer giant, and it's an Englishman called Jov, Jov Lovetrop, who um, was captured by the Spanish and first um, forced to work in their in their uh, as a sailor on board a Spanish vessel. And off the coast of Bermuda, in the 1570s, he saw a giant, a mer giant, in the sea. And it was, um, I think it came some 20 or 30 feet out of the sea. Um, Possibly a whale, slightly unclear what he actually saw, but he reports it in a matter of fact way. The other person, the first person who actually saw, uh, we have, we still have a first-hand account of what they actually saw, well, semi-first-hand account, is um, Christopher Columbus. Um, I say semi-first-hand account because his memoirs are sort of halfway between being first-hand and second-hand. Um, and he claims that he saw a mermaid in the West Indies, uh, but he says they were very, very ugly and, uh, and, very, and very sluggish. And so everyone assumes that he was actually seeing a, 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 um, a Cyrenian, a, a manatee. Or a, we'll return to that story in, in a moment or two. By the, end of the, um, by the end of the 17th century, people are starting to get the first kind of um, skeptical account saying the ideas of mer people are probably not true. Despite that, there are still people though who are saying that they're having first-hand experiences of actually seeing um, uh, mer people. So here we've got one from the early part of the 17th century, Captain, Captain Richard Whitbourne. Now also I will not omit to relate something of a strange creature which I first saw there in 1610. Oh, sorry, I must have the date wrong if that's 1610. In, uh, maybe it's 1618. In the morning earlier, I was standing by the waterside in the harbour of St. John, so this is Canada, where I spied very swiftly to come swimming towards me, looking cheerfully as if there had been a woman by the face, eyes, nose, mouth, chin, ears, neck and forehead. It seemed so beautiful and in those parts so well proportioned, having round about upon her head all blue streaks resembling hair down to the neck. But certainly it was hair, for I beheld it long, another of my company also, uh, this, I suppose, was a mermaid. Now, because diverse have written of much of mermaids and presumed to relate what is most certain of such a strange creature that is seen in Newfoundland, where whether it was a mermaid or not, I know not, I leave for others to judge. So he thinks it probably is a mermaid, but isn't 100% uh, sure. Here we have another example of somebody who, whilst... Um, Mermaid, he took a less um, a less passive uh, attitude towards it. So um, this is somebody um, in Mauritius, and um, the mermaid, both male and female, are often caught here, and I've tasted it, and it tastes not unlike veal. Uh, the inhabitants consider it very fine eating. It's a large fish, about three or four hundred, I think that's pounds in weight. The head particularly large, as are the features, which differ but little from a man or a woman. The male has a beard four or five inches long, female are short neck and breasts exactly human. And where from when first taken, they grieve and lament with the utmost sensibility. It's an amphibious creature, creature and often taken off the grass. Well, the mention of the grass tells you it's probably a um, Cyrenian then, so it's a, man a manatee or, 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 or dugong. Um, and um, despite its similarity to human beings, it didn't stop um, uh, the gentleman who wrote this from actually, um, uh, actually eating it. So there we have a dugong. Uh, sorry, this is a manatee, not a dugong. Um, and you can see, yes, it could be perceived as being um, like a mermaid. Um, and this is probably what Christopher Columbus was re referring to as well. So the idea started to grow in the 18th century then that mermaids were uh, misinterpreted as Cyrenians. And that's the class that includes manatees and dugongs. And this is an idea which is fairly commonplace to, to this day. And if you kind of go on the um, Wikipedia as the font of um, ignorant knowledge, um, they'll say, oh, yes, mermaids are mythologized um, uh, Cyrenians. But that's probably not entirely true. There's another animal which I think also is implicated in accounts of mermaids. And that, of course, is the seal. 
And a thing I'm trying to do with my statistical hat on at the moment is I'm collecting accounts of mermaids around the British Isles, and I'm correlating that with where we know seals are, because my suspicion is that um, mermaid stories and mermaid accounts come predominantly from regions where there are actually um, seal colonies. They're often thought of as being um, stories of the Celtic fringe, but the Celtic fringe also coincides with where there are actually seals. And, so, and many of the Selkie stories from the Northern Isles are very, very similar to some mermaid stories as well. So I think there are a lot of parallels there. So if you want to, I think mermaids and merpeople have multiple zoological origins, but seals are just as important as Cyrenians in the origin of merpeople. Another animal which may account for some of the white um, mermaids that have been seen is something like a beluga whale. Uh, you can see here, um, they can have sort of lumps on their chests, which, are, which aren't actually um, breasts, but um, they can look like breasts. Uh, they, have, um, they do have breasts, but they're basically it's just, it's just nipples. You won't really see a particular difference. Um, so maybe some of the northern white mermaids could have been beluga whales. Uh, beluga whales are unique amongst whales in they um, can actually turn their heads relative to the body, which makes them perhaps rather more human than many other species of whale might actually look. Uh, another animal which might be considered, if you had a very toothy mermaid, uh, could be a walrus, but not all walruses actually have teeth, so you could have something more, more like this. Um, but because of its moustache, you might think that people would think of it more as a merman than a, than a, a mermaid. It does make you wonder, though, maybe this animal, if you imagine those horns were slightly in the wrong place, maybe that's an account of an actual um, walrus. So this was a very, very rapid history of um, the rationalization of mer people. It's a very complicated story. I, I kind of, I've simplified it a lot. And it's complicated by the fact that there are lots of diverse strands of what's going on. There's lots of diverse forms that mer people actually take. And of course, with the emergence of modern science, you've still got in parallel to that really until the beginning of the 19th century. Um, first-hand accounts of people actually saying that they've reported mermaids. Um, many from Scotland, actually. Um, and of course, mer people continue to this day to be um, uh, images of mermaids are common in, in artwork, um, they're still fairly common in films. Um, with the famous fairy story of the Little Mermaid, and there's the statue of the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen, and there's the Disney film The Little Mermaid. But that's a very narrow view of what constitutes a, a mer person, a mer being, um, which are in fact, as we've seen, incredibly diverse. And um, especially, I mean, I've shown you just a handful of images from um, medieval manuscripts, but the diversity of strange images from medieval manuscripts. Um, well, to give you an example, um, you get what we can only really describe as um, mermen, which aren't, haven't got a fish tail, but they've got the body of a lobster. So they're sort of lobster men. Um, all sorts of weird, weird, weird animals can be found in medieval um, manuscripts. And so the history of, um, the scientific history of, of mer people is actually really interesting because it brings out all these different strands of diversity uh, and, and, and folkloric meaning from early on in their history to um, the development of modern science and how science starts comp comp compartmentalizing knowledge from the, from the 17th and um, 18th century onwards. So it's a, a tale which I can only really talk about uh, in, in the crudest terms here, but um, if you want to find out more, when the um, uh, exhibition opens at Data Mess Unicorn, um, there's be lots of um, posters where you can actually see the um, the history of mermaids, and, and we should talk about some other issues which I didn't have time to talk about uh, today. 